Oh. So, many of you probably think I've been on vacation, but it's, it's been far from the truth. What it has been is just a, traditionally this is a really busy time for me. This is, um, the, the harvest is all but over for the carrots and, um, and so all the machinery that washes that stuff in and gets it ready to go into a bag, it needs to be rebuilt because it's worked hard all year and that's just how it is. And so for me, the last couple of months, I have just been crazy, crazy busy. And on top of that, I've been given a mature age apprenticeship as a fitter and turner through work. So that's something that I'm really excited about, but also have to do. So it's just meant that between work and TAFE and obviously family, um, the YouTube channel's just had to take a bit of a hit. But I'm starting to get on top of that stuff now, I hope. And so I'm out here today and I've got the camera rolling. So for the first half of the video to make any sense, we're going to have to go back in time about four months. I've never time traveled um, on this particular lathe. I've watched enough of this old Tony videos to, um, you know, to work it out. I think I've got a handle on it anyway. Except I don't know if I can travel in metric. Four. Well, if you're a dentist, this is the moment of tooth. <laughs> Nuts. Right. Good morning, YouTube. Or whatever time zone you're in. <clears throat> I'm not sure where to start. This is working surprisingly well. I, um, and I need to bring up some interesting mistakes that I've made. Don't trust everything you hear on the internet because um, I'll Google uh, my ignorance mixed with Google's influence um, meant that I actually completely stuffed up the direction of the vortex in this build. But it still worked, which is really interesting. Um, that being that uh, what I should have done is not ask the question of what way water swirls, but rather what direction a cyclone turns, or if you're in the other side of the, of the globe, uh, which way a typhoon rotates. Because that would have been the correct way to set this up. So, in saying that though, I am pleasantly surprised and pleased to know that it perhaps it really just doesn't matter uh, which way you have it swirling. Um, because as you all saw in the previous video, the, the vortex was quite happy and healthy and really didn't need any extra attention. So an initial problem with this design is having this secondary air intake so close to the front of this. So basically the, I've, I've got two competing forces for air and this one is always going to overcome that one. It's not that this wasn't sucking air. I did a few more test burns later on and discovered that it was in fact drawing some air in. Um, it wasn't as much as I would like, but then again, I'm, I'm really uh, very new to this style of stove and so I'm not sort of sure what or how much air it should be drawing in, but I plan on capping this and putting a small, uh, a small opening here that I can control the air flow through. I also want to put a door on the front and that's going to help reflect uh, heat back into the stove. Really help to um, keep some of that heat in where I want it uh, going up through the stove and not sort of lost out the front. Okay, now this is fireproof glass. Um, that's newspaper, but this is fireproof glass. Yep, it's definitely fireproof glass. And apparently it's rated to 760 degrees C, um, up to 800 apparently. And that'll be perfect for what I want here. So I bought two pieces. And it came with, for a few bob extra, 
some of this, um, what's it called? Fiberglass self-adhesive tape, white, two meters. Pack de ban de reckon schlick auto kaulum ben two meters. My German isn't any good. So this is an interesting challenge. I did a test fold while you were distracted to see if the folder could actually make it. This is a very tight um, fold to try to do because of the thickness of the um, that of that bit. Normally, that would dictate the uh, the minimum fold that you're able to do. You just have to do it in a few stages. Again, this is why scribe marks are better than texture marks because <laughs> it enables you to really get, get a little bit more precise. They've just disappeared, my scribe marks, which is the, um, how I try to keep everything consistent. Now, I can't do a full fold here. If I do, I won't be able to get the next fold. I've got to come up just a little bit. I think I need to move the camera stand. It's interfering with the fold. I've just kicked it. It's going to partially crush that, I know, but it's all right. It's still about the same fold again. And come back. Okay, now we can give it a bit more. Basically, you have to do the fold incrementally, where you're just giving it a little bit at a time until you get to where you want. It's getting very close. There you go. That's how you cheat. Now the important part, does it fit? Oh! Now in order to get really good results when you're sort of polishing a bit of stainless steel, and I'm not really doing this properly, not by any stretch of the imagination, is try not to use anything too aggressive to remove the initial welds. Um, I used a worn out 80 grit flapper disc and very lightly remove the bulk of the material and now I'm coming over it with a, a flapper disc that is made out of scotch bright pads 
and notice how I'm moving in the same direction. I'm starting on the edge of the material and I'm coming back. And, and I try to keep my motions consistent in speed and pressure and also always starting at the edge of the material and flying all the way across to the other side. It's just a little tip to, um, to get a nice result. And now, watermelon smoothie. Yeah, because my wife loves me. A better thing to do when cutting out a square like this is to drill out the four corners. Just makes removing it when you're done a bit easier. Puts a nice radius all the way around in the, in the edges instead of like a sharp 90 degree corner. But what can I say? It was um, it was 12 steps to the drill press from where I was and that was just a journey too far for me at the time. If you've never seen an Australian get really excited, brace yourself. Nice. Yep, that, that, that's about it. I know. So I'm going with a 316 rivet to attach the frame to the stove. I've drilled five millimeter holes in the frame and a 316 rivet in millimeters is about 4.8 something like that. It works out pretty darn good actually. You get a little bit of clearance and Aaron is in the background talking to me. I guess jamming a croquette ball in your eye socket would have that effect. Now the stainless steel frame and the glass will be attached to the stove after all the painting's done, so for now I'm going to have to go and do other stuff. You know, if you don't have a folder at home and you really want to recreate this design, it's not the end of the world. All you need to do is score your fold marks of a grinder. Don't cut all the way through, just weaken it enough so that you can put it in a vise or put it over the edge of a table and hammer it around. And that's how you can go about it. And, 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 um, and that's what I used to do. There's nothing wrong with that. And once it's all welded, I don't even think that it weakens it all that much as well. Not that that would really matter for a little door. Oh, gee, that's on there tight. And when you've got segmented tooling like this, if you can get it out. There we go. Segmented tooling makes life a lot easier. I need to think about this. I want to do these two folds first. Tiny bit over. Nice. I always say that when you're folding sheet metal, it's much better to go a little bit over. A little bit, not like, <laughs> like two kilometers past where you need to be. Like, it's very easy to bring it back because the metal has memory. 
sounds strange, but and it'll always come back to where it was. It's kind of like a homing pigeon, only metalier. I love sheet metal. That's still set at 25. I'm going to scribe a line. Scribe a line. And now, we join those all up. There we go. Okay. That looks terrible.
you saw that coming. wanted to take the discoloration out of it now. Once the handle and everything's on there, it would just, I figured it'd be sort of hard to get in there and to do that. So now just to determine the length of this. Um, I reckon about there. Ah. camera just stopped for some reason but that's the mechanism that's locked position and that'll be obviously open I'm not sure how I feel about this yet I'll run with it for now it's it's not as <laughs> nice looking as I thought it should be <laughs> oh, anyway it's a little bit of three mil I'm not going to fully weld this, that's so just silliness. I might pretend to know what I'm doing when it comes to welding. But I want to be upfront with you guys right now. I have no idea what I'm doing with this thing yet. One step at a time. A, that's an M5. Sorry, <laughs> that is a five millimeter hole that's been tapped out to an M6 tap. Six millimeter hole, and the threaded bit is just going to contain the bolt to stop it from sliding in and out. I'm going to weld a small circle, a bit of steel in there, and that's going to be the the flow control for the secondary air intake. Oh, my phone. Yellow. Bah. 
All right. I'm sort of... Nobody breathe. No, no, actually breathe. That's, that's a terrible request to make. Oh yeah, that's, that's a guillotine. Um, we'll talk about that later. Uh. Oh, oh, oh. oh, remember folks, lift with your back. It's the strongest muscle in your body. <laughs> that's terrible advice. That's the thing of this drill. It doesn't have a high or a low setting. It's just, it's all in or nothing. And that's why I don't use it very much. Or as I call it, it's my wristy twisty drill. Okay, so in the first build, the only air inlet is like a tiny slit somewhere about there. I uh, just used a grinder. Um, I, I didn't feel right about it at the time, but I thought, ah, eh, I can always open it up and make it bigger if I need to, and well, <laughs> it's exactly what I'm doing. So let's try 25 mil. And of course, this air dampener is not going to do a thing if there's a gaping hole at the front. I'm going to weld that on there. So now the only way for air to get in is past this fella. And yes, this, this hole is smaller than this. Uh, it doesn't matter. It absolutely doesn't matter. It just gonna mean, it's going to mean that it's easier for me to weld this. Because um, at the end of the day, this hole is still larger than the hole down the other end, which is 25 mil. This is 35 mil, so um, it's not going to be the greatest point of restriction, this butterfly valve will be. There's an old saying, a grinder and paint makes you the welder you ain't. I ended up running the TIG welder, TIG welder over it. If you saw what the result was, I think you all would have unsubscribed. So Now, secondary air intake. I'm putting a hole every 50 mils because counting in units of five is really easy for me. Don't judge me. Just been looking at some of the old footage that I took and in some cases the, f the vortex and the fire had swirled you know, almost a couple of inches from the top, which tells me that there's still obviously a fair bit of heat and combustion going on in the riser. So if I was to add a little bit of air, you could just drill holes on the outside and just have them open to the atmosphere and let it, it would draw air in, but it wouldn't be preheated air. It wouldn't be as preheated compared to 
having it go through a bit of a, a channel. So I'm going to have a hole in the base down here which you can't see. I'm going to fold up a bit of a shroud, a cover, a channel. And I'm going to fully weld all the way up here and have 8mm holes. Why 8mm? Because it's the size drill bit that I have the most of. Don't you judge. And now it's time to address the elephant in the room, or in this case it's the, uh, the guillotine. I finally bit the bullet and bought something that I've always wanted, and this is this little guillotine. Uh, I've had to sort of do some repair work to it. Uh, it was probably more just wasn't quite set up right from factory. But basically it's the same capacity as my little folder, which is 2 millimeter by 1350, I believe. And this is just going to make life so much easier. Uh, quicker, I should say. Less grinding, more action. Here goes nothing. Now that oh, is nice. Hey, what's uh, 60 plus 10 plus 10 plus 4 plus 20? The answer is 104. Awesome. Alrighty. Oh. Looks about right. you'll see that the hole is offset and that we're longer on one side than the other. That's because I'm, I'm trying to increase the capacity inside of here just so that it holds more hot air, if that makes sense. Sort of, anyway, um, I don't know if it's going to make any difference or not. I'm just goofing off. But yes, but I haven't put any holes down here in the Vortex generator itself. Um, uh, it's just that there's a lot going on down there and I don't want to mess with it not when it's running as nice as it is so yeah I've had a lot so many suggestions about putting a you know a bit of pipe up the guts of it and doing all sorts of stuff and um, if this doesn't work well I'll explore that avenue but for, to begin with I'm going to do the simplest option first because um, it's nice when the simplest option works before I go welding this in place all the way down there I'm just going to work out this cap piece. I did a little bit of work in a in a hot rod shop. It's only a tiny bit of work. I, um, I sort of I was in between jobs, but I was amazed how much they use this technique, where you just I'm not doing a very good job here. Just the dirty fingers and a bit of paper and just running it around the edges. Yay for dirty hands. That's my template. That looks pretty good to me. So yeah, it pays not to wash your hands, except for when you're in a pandemic. That's terrible. Maybe it does pay to wash your hands. So today is the first day of winter and I am really beginning to wonder why on earth I moved across to this drafty old shed and uh, didn't just stay in my nice warm garage. So uh, 
Um, yes, I'm going back over there where there's a fire. I must have spent up big in the future. That's not going to work. I wonder if I can get that to balance there. So, we have a secondary air intake in the back. We'll be able to tune that. The air will be preheated as it goes in. Obviously, it'll be the hottest when it gets to the top uh, as it mixes in. Okay, I'm really excited. I'm nearly ready to do a test burn. Oh, blow the dust off that. Got to screw this thing on yet. Um, I think I mentioned, well, I know I mentioned that I was going to use rivets, but then I thought about it. I'm like, I'm going to want to pull this thing off to clean it because it will soot up. So forget the rivets. I'm going to um, tap the holes because they're five millimeter. Tap them with an M6 tap. And that's how I'm going to stick that on. And before I do a test burn, I really need to finish this air control thing on the front of this door. I think that's just work hard and that to the max. I don't know, decorative or destructive?
see what happens when we close the door. So I'm about halfway through that hopper of pellets, but I just wasn't getting uh, re really good results with this door closed. And after playing around for, I don't know, however long it's been, about there is where it's at as far as the, um, the airflow requirements of this stove. So I'm going to try to measure that gap and work out what I need to add to this front door to get the equivalent amount of airflow going through. The other thing I did was I just sat that bit of RHS there on top to increase the draw and that made a, that made a huge difference. That's not a good sign. Um, that again tells me that there's, I've just got too much fuel burning and I would actually get a better results if there was less fuel on fire. So I'm coming to some conclusions about this. I think my basket's too big. All right, boys. You've had your fun. Just had an influx of orders, and so I've had to I've had to get busy. One of these emus might be in your very home. That's a spooky thought. Oof. This is a little bit tedious, so I'm, I'm only showing you bits and bobs. You're getting a photo? Story, nice. Good test burn, but it it's just not there yet, and I'm not going to post the video until it's ready. Beautiful. Thank you, Liz. But while I was doing my test burn, um, to get a decent amount of combustion, I sort of needed the door open about, about that much. So I really want this closed, one to keep ash in, to help reflect heat back, but, I, but I'm starving it of oxygen, so that's what this thing is. That is going to go on there. And I'm thinking of putting it as close as I can to this so that the air is flowing straight down because this goes in this way. I want the air to flow straight down um, and around. You know, if it's out there, I'm going to have a little bit of a dead spot. I'm trying to avoid that, so if that makes sense.
we started this video with a watermelon smoothie and looks like we're finishing it with a watermelon smoothie. <laughs> Do you have to test it? Uh huh. So after months of working on this thing, trying to get it better, the vortex was was worse off than when I started, and and this thing was turning into a titanic failure. I, I was getting miserable. It was only one thing to do. So when the period of mourning was finished, I started knuckling down and trying to work out where I went wrong. One of the first things I recognized was that the gap between the burn basket uh, and the base of the stove was too great, and I needed to reduce that. And um, I turned my rocket stove into a slow combustion stove by lifting that up. That piece you saw me weld on works as a stop to govern the height of the burn basket. Works well. Not drawn to scale, but this is what I'm wanting to do. I noticed that the stove perked up a bit when I added a little bit to the riser. So I'm going to make all this out of um, this 1.6 millimetre hot rolled steel underneath. For the sake of time, I left out the pattern development of this part. Sorry about that. Um, but if you want to know how to do this sort of stuff, let me know in the comments and I will make a dedicated video on uh, pattern development for cones and um, notching pipe and making wraparounds and doing all that sort of fun stuff. It's not that hard actually when you know how and uh, it'd be fun to show you, but not enough time now. You're still looking for dinosaur bones. Gosh, it's a never ending saga. Well, that came out like a dog's breakfast, but we'll be able to do something with that. Better. This is the world's worst rotary welding table. Um, but the problem is it works and it hasn't broken yet and so I keep using it. I really need to remake it. Um, that might, that'll be a video in the future. Uh, as it is, I'd, I'd be really embarrassed to show you what's going on on the inside of that toolbox. It's kind of scary.
I have mixed feelings about that. It's just didn't quite go to plan. I would have liked to have had a really nice uh, stack of dimes around there, but couldn't get comfortable. Didn't have the right diameter filler wire and sort of using the wrong machine for the job. And that's my excuse and I'm sticking to it. stages in the warm-up it starts to soot up the, um, the, like, the glass it just does it every time and they do it but, all the time at night time but very soon the thing will get so hot that it actually burns all that all that soot off and it, the glass will become crystal clear again it's quite amazing there well, you sit right there you can sit right there Okay, that's a shot of the secondary air intake. You can just see the hole. There. There you go. That's just lovely. Let's see. 425.8 degrees C. Let's go Fahrenheit. Mmm, my. Wow. I've been screwing around with this thing for, I don't know, a couple of days now and one thing became apparent very quickly was that with the door closed it was not getting enough air. In fact I sort of thought that for a while all things were lost but when I left the door cracked about that much um, everything just worked so for the sake of time because this video is a long one I've, um, I've blown out the air controller in there. I've just removed it completely. I'm hoping that'll be enough oxygen to make this thing run properly now with the door shut. Uh, the advantage of having the door shut is that it reflects some heat back into the stove, into the basket, helping to keep everything running. With a stove with that insulation, you've got to grab every bit of heat you can. Um, and in saying that, insulation would be a huge help to this, but it would also cause steel to rapidly uh, fall to bits. Just that all that extra heat would, um, it wouldn't be good. The other addition is an extension to the riser. All it's doing is increasing the draw. Um, the longer the flue, within reason, the longer the flue, um, the more convection you get, the greater the draw. Uh, that's another reason why an insulated riser is a good thing because it makes the riser hotter, increasing your draw. Um, so I could insulate this. I'm still umming and ahhing about it. There will be another um, an, a, an addition to this video, but this video is just getting too long with some extra stuff that I have in mind to do. But I'll, I'll keep that a surprise. And that is just a press fit on there. 
like that and um, and I'll probably never get that off again now it's it's really tight but that's good that's what you want this has been a marathon so I just want to say uh, thanks for hanging around I'll catch you in the next one see you guys bye